Artsakh is mentioned in the earliest inscriptions, uh, in the earliest cuneiform inscriptions of the kingdom of Ararat ar from around 2,800 years ago. It's uh, mentioned as uh, uh, Urdehi or Ard Ardahi in the cuneiform inscriptions of kingdom of Ararat, also known as Urartu. It's an early Armenian kingdom that we have. Subsequently, it was also part of Armenian homeland. So uh, the sub subsequent uh, Yervanduni or Orontid dynasty of Armenia, during that period, Artsakh was also uh, part of the kingdom of Armenia. Uh, and later on, of course, uh, under the Artashesian dynasty, uh, Artsakh is also an integral part of the kingdom of greater Armenia. It was a, an important Eastern Armenian province, uh, the 10th province of greater Armenia that is mentioned is also in Armenian classical sources, in non-Armenian sources also. Uh, the Greek or Roman sources also note that, you know, Artsakh was part of um, kingdom of Armenia. Uh, Strabo, who is considered the father of geography, first century BC, first century AD Greek uh, historian and geographer, also mentions that Artsakh is part of Armenia. He uses the, the Greek version uh, of Artsakh or Histene as part of mentioning that, you know, it is also part of the uh, uh, kingdom of greater Armenia. Uh, and he notes that, you know, uh, Armenia extends all the way to the Kur River uh, and the Caspian Sea. During Tigran the Great's time in the first century BC, Tigran the Great established a number of important Armenian cities named after him, Tigran Nakertz, which literally means built by Tigran. And one of these cities was actually in uh, Artsakh. So, uh, we weren't sure about the location of uh, Tigran Akert, and then uh, in early 2000s, there were excavations, and then archaeological team led by uh, archaeologist Hamlet Petrosian uh, actually found the remains of Tigran Akert. Uh, very important finds were made from here, including earliest Armenian uh, inscribed uh, inscriptions. Uh, so the city was established in the, during the Tigran the Great's time as Tigran Akert, and later on uh, it continued its life as an important Armenian city. Uh, it's in today in vicinity of uh, to, of today's Agdam, uh, so to speak, or Akna, uh, which you know, uh, unfortunately, after the war of. Uh, 2020, this territory, which we never lost it militarily, was handed over by the Armenian side to the Azeris. When Mashtots revived the use of the Armenian alphabet in the 5th century, it is mentioned that, for example, one of, one of the first schools that he founded that were using Mashtotian alphabet were in Artsakh in places like the Amaras Monastery. So we know that Artsakh was a very important Armenian learning center, um, Armenian cultural center, uh, basically you can say. So it wasn't, it wasn't just Armenian borderline province, but it was a very important Armenian province where Armenian culture thrived. So this, this is a very important uh, point that we have to make that Artsakh was played a very important role in Armenian cultural, political, social life in general. After the fall of Great Kingdom or independence of Greater Armenia in the fifth century, Artsakh continued to play an important role in Armenian life. For example, in our national liberation uh, struggle in the Battle of Avarite, in the Vartanans War in, in the fifth century. In the medieval period, uh, although we had lost our independence, but it still locally it was ruled by Armenian lords or Nakharars uh, of Artsakh. And it was also uh, intimately tied to Sunik, 
because sometimes Artsakh was also referred to as lesser Sunni. That is to say, like the like uh, the Sunni province was greater Sunni and uh, Artsakh was lesser Sunni. So it was also very intimately connected to the neighboring our neighboring province of Sunni. Uh, and as such, it was a part of the greater Armenian uh, region, uh, uh, also known as the Eastern Armenian lands, uh, which would include Shunik, Artsakh, Utik province, which is north, uh, northeast of Artsakh, all the way to the Kur River, and also the Paitakaran province, which extends to the Caspian Sea. So these important Eastern Armenian provinces were sort of like uh, play, defended Armenia on the east, on the Eastern borders. In the ninth century, the King Armenian independence was restored. And in the 9th, 10th, 10th century, Artsakh was also incorporated in the, into the restored kingdom of Armenia under the Bagratunis. Uh, although at times there were foreign invasions, it was broken off. After the fall in the 5th century, after the fall of Sasanian Iran, there was an invasion of Armenia, etc., by the Arabs and others. But, uh, you know, it, it continued to be inhabited by Armenians, which, as I said, was mentioned by Greco-Roman uh, scholars that say that, you know, it was inhabited by Armenians and it continued to be in the, the, into the Middle Ages all the way even uh, until the 17th, 18th century. In the medieval times, there were different Armenian principalities that also uh, existed on the territory of Artsakh. We have, for example, the Khachen, Principality of Khachen in uh, late Middle Ages. When the first Turkic invaders uh, came uh, in the 11th century. They were never. They never established themselves. It came from Central Asia and invaded our own homeland, the Seljuks and other different various Turkic tribes that came from Central Asia. They never established themselves in 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 most of Artsakh. You know, they continued these Turkic invaders after the 11th century. They, they continued to live this nomadic lifestyle. When Armenians were set, settled, uh, these Turkic invaders, you know, they were nomads or semi-nomads, so they would have their flocks of sheep and they would, you know, uh, just move around to different parts. They never settled in, in Artsakh and especially in mountainous parts of Artsakh, but in general, not even like the, the valleys and these places, they never settled. Uh, it's very important to mention that, you know, uh, today, for example, when the Azeris claim it's part of Azerbaijan, uh, you know, historically, it's not uh, supported by historical evidence. Uh, this area was never part of Azerbaijan as a province because Azerbaijan is actually the name of uh, the neighboring province at of Atropotene which is south of the Arax River. And it's an it's a Iranian name, Atropatin, which later on in the Arabic and Muslim sources was also known as Azerbaijan. Uh, so this province of Atropatin or Azerbaijan, Muslim sources, classical sources, Armenian sources, all sources mentioned is always south of the, uh, of the Arax River. A little bit about the history of the name of this Azerbaijan, how it came to be extended to today's, uh, you know, Azerbaijani Republic. So in 1918, these, uh, there was this uh, Turkic, pan-Turkish movement began by the young Turks that they wanted to unify all of the Turkic-speaking people around Turkey. And, you know, uh, in fact, Armenian genocide was one of the reasons that Armenian genocide happened. It was because of this pan-Turkism. They wanted to unite all the Turkic-speaking people and Armenians and other non-Turkic nationalities were kind of in the way of creating this Turkic empire, this Turan, as they called it. And, you know, this so-called Azeris of today, they also joined this movement. These, who at this time were known under different names, 
uh, Qatars, I don't know, even just Muslims. They didn't have a specific name in different sources at this time. Different names were used by these for these people. Uh, Tatars, Tatars of Caucasus, Muslims, uh, mainly. These were the names used. Uh, there wasn't a specific name. When the brother of Enver Pasha, one of the three main organizers of the Armenian genocide, Nuri Pasha, he actually um, and carried out fresh massacres against the Armenians. He actually said that you're going to use the name Azerbaijan you're going to establish a republic in May of 1918. And then we can actually claim the main real Azerbaijan, which is south of Arax River. So it was a pan-Turkist drive at trying to annex and take over the real Azerbaijan, which is in Iran. It's in basically in northwestern uh, Iran, this area. area. And that's why they adopted this name Azeri, but they still call themselves Turks, Tatars, this different name. They never called themselves Azeris. Uh, and as a matter of fact, at that time, in uh, August of 1918, the Iranian government sent a note of protest to the Turkish government, to the young Turks, saying that you have uh, illegally usurp the name, the real name of Azerbaijan, and are using it for a province and a people that have never been known under that name. You know, the real Azerbaijan, because the Iranians, they understood what is going on. So they sent this note of protest, which is very important, historic, that, you know, this area has never been part of Azerbaijan. Uh, so we will never recognize this republic under this name, because this area, it's historic Armenia, historic Albania. In the Middle Ages, it was uh, other parts of it, of this Albania was known as Shirvan. It was never known under the name of Azerbaijan. Uh, and even today, even today, they claim these people south of the Arax River who are, you know, uh, these Azaris, these Iranian people with historic... Uh, Iranian background, they claim as, as 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 their own because again, this is part of this pan-Turkist drive at establishing this pan-Turkist Turan, uh, which still this ideology, this pan-Turkist ideology is still well and alive, and you can even say it's growing uh, because Turkey it helped to establish this pan-Turkic uh, uh, council. Uh, first, it was known as uh, Council of Turkic-speaking uh, countries. Now it's called Council of uh, Turkic uh, countries. Just, just you know, they dropped even Turkic-speaking. You know, so th this this attempt at still creating this Turan is well and alive, and you know they want to incorporate into this territory parts of Russia, parts of China, even Central Asian Turkic countries such as Turkmenistan. Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, etc. Even today, for example, when they claim this so-called Zangezur corridor that supposed to be has to connect from Nakhichevan, which was historically Armenian, another Armenian province that is uh, occupied by uh, uh, Azeris. Uh, and there are no Armenians today, it's all completely ethnically cleansed of Armenians. Uh, you know, they they want this corridor go extending from Artsakh and all the way through Sunik to Nakhichevan and to Turkey. And this is again part of this, you know, pan-Turkist ideology because even in uh, Turkish different uh, sources, they call it, even Azeris themselves, they call it Gates of Turan. Artsakh was, uh, you know, through self-determination and the League of Nations also suggested that, you know, having a majority Armenian population in 1920, it has to be part of the Republic of Armenia. However, what happened in late 1920, Armenia was invaded and occupied by the Bolsheviks on one side and the Kemalists on the other. Eastern parts of Armenia, including Artsakh and these areas and were, were occupied by the Bolsheviks and the, you know, these, these Tatars 
who later on were known as the Azeris, were helping them out. They were on their side. Even at this time, the so-called leaders of this Azerbaijan or Soviet Azerbaijan, they, they recognized that, you know, 90 plus percent Artsakh, it cannot be part of a territory of so-called Azerbaijan, which has this 90, 95 percent Armenian population. Azeri leader Nariman mm -hmm. Narimanov said that it's part of uh, Soviet Armenia. Then of uh, July, in July of 1921, there was also a Bolshevik uh, decision that, yes, you know, it should be part of, uh, Artsakh should be part of Soviet Armenia. But what happened is uh, Joseph Stalin, the later dicta uh, dictator of Soviet Union, who at this time occupied important Bolshevik, you know, Soviet communist posts in, 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 in Russia, he said that, no, 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 you know, uh, we have to accommodate Turkey because Turkey was pressuring Soviet Russia, saying, you know, have pro Azeri uh, decisions. Uh, and then, you know, he said, hey, let's make Artsakh part of uh, Azerbaijan. So in 1921, this is what happened. In 19, uh, Armenians resisted, resented this, this unfair, illegal decision by the single handed decision of this dictator, later dictator, you know, this Bolshevik leader. Uh, and it was illegal because he made that decision without taking into consideration even Soviet Armenian leadership's position. Even Azeri leadership said, you know, we don't want this. So he basically overrode all of this. As I said earlier, the Azeri said it, it should be part of Armenia. And he started to push this inclusion of 90 plus percent populated Armenian Artsakh into uh, Azerbaijan, so even Soviet Azerbaijan. In 1923, they sort of made this halfway right. attempt at establishing Armenian autonomy in mountainous parts of Artsakh. And we have to realize when we say Artsakh, it's a much bigger territory than the territory that was established in 1923. This autonomous Armenian territory uh, within uh, Soviet Azerbaijan. So they established this mountainous autonomous territory uh, region of uh, Gharabagh, of Gharabagh, mountainous Gharabagh, autonomous region, only encompassing the mountainous parts of Artsakh. But even the name Gharabagh, even Artsakh, of course, as we know, it's a greater area which encompassed the territory uh, around adjoining the so-called mountainous Gharabagh region. But what is important, Artsakh, the territory of Artsakh, was never part of independent Azerbaijan. It was part of the USSR as a country. And it was a territorial uh, unit within USSR as an autonomous region. It was never part of independent Azerbaijan. But... Azeris continued to sort of like uh, use the soft power to gradually decrease Armenian presence in Artsakh. All of the Armenians of Nakhichevan were ethnically cleansed. There are no Armenians now in Nakhichevan, historically Armenian region. Other parts like, for example, adjoining Gardban, which is in the Utik province north of Artsakh. There were hundreds of Armenian villages and Tens, even hundreds of thousands of Armenians in this Gardman territory of Utik. It was cleansed of Armenians. The population of Artsakh during the Soviet rule started to drop from 90 plus to around 70 percent Armenian. Uh, for example, the, an important city was Shushi. Shushi was a cultural hub and center of Armenian life of Artsakh. In the 19th century, Shushi was like an important Armenian cultural center for all of Armenian life. You know, there were uh, many newspapers, different cultural activities, very important Armenian cultural, even political uh, center, the city of Shushi. In 1920, the Azeris carried out a uh, massacre of Armenians of Shushi. Thousands of Armenians were killed. Many were driven away, and you can say, you know, from that time, the, it began the downfall of the city. After the destruction of Shushi, by the way, the new capital of uh, Artsakh was proclaimed the city of Stepanakert, and its historic Armenian name is Vararakan. So when we sometimes say Stepanakert, we have to also remember 
that it's all ancient Armenian name from the ancient and medieval times is Vararakan. Armenians in the Soviet period, even in the 60s, 70s, 80s, they constantly raised the issue that, you know, it been illegally and unfairly placed. Artsakh has been placed as part of the Soviet Azerbaijan, Soviet uh, Socialist Republic, uh, this administrative unit within the USSR. So they wanted it moved from this administrative uh, region to Armenia, Soviet Armenia, and they were pushing for this. And then in the 1980s, when Gorbachev came to power, he proclaimed that, you know, from now on, you know, human rights, democracy in the Soviet Union is going to be more respected, more recognized. So, you know, Armenians uh, believed and hoped that, you know, again, it was the right time to raise this issue because, you know, Artsakh Armenians were under this constant slow erosion of their Armenian identity and life. So the Armenians, again, in 1987, 1988, this movement, this democratic movement for reunification or, you know, uh, with uh, Soviet Armenia, with Armenia of Artsakh uh, began. Uh, but unfortunately, as we know, you know, Azeris answered in their uh traditional uh, way, which was basically through massacres and immediately after, in for example, in Azeri cities such as Sungait and later on in other parts of uh, Azerbaijan in Armenian historic city of Ganzak, which at that time was in 88, uh, Kirovabad, Armenian massacres took place in 1990 in Baku in January of 1990. Uh, Armenians were massacred in Baku. So the Azeris basically, unfortunately, rejected this. They started to, you know, attack Armenians physically. Clashes began. And from these massacres, unfortunately, uh, led to the clash, to the military conflict with Azerbaijan. But, of course, Armenians initially hoped that through peaceful means, you know, Artsakh would be reunited with Armenia and, you know, justice would be restored. Uh, but, unfortunately, this did not happened. Gorbachev did not agree to this. You know, the Soviet leadership, unfortunately, did not do this. Azeris began, as I said, through violence, you know, tried to attack Armenians, and this led to the conflict. And, um, you know, uh, from then, in the 1990s, we had the war with the Azeris, uh, culminating with the war. We were able to establish, uh, you know, defend Artsakh, defend Artsakh, even this parts of historic Artsakh that were under uh, Azeri control were liberated by Armenians. Um, but the Azeri side, they, they as even today, you know, they, they claim that they're for peaceful solution. They want peace with Armenians, but we see through their, what they're doing, uh, you know, that does, that not, that does not facilitate peace. You cannot have peace when, uh, you know, you're constantly threatening uh, not only Artsakh Armenians, but you're constantly threatening Sunni Armenians. They claim all of Armenia belongs to them. So we have to understand there's a bigger agenda at play. There's a bigger struggle at play. Again, leading to this hate-filled, you know, racist ideology of pan-Turkism that, you know, created at one point this Azerbaijan that led to the Armenian genocide that led to all of these clashes, it's still at play today, now. And we have to constantly point this out because if we don't, we don't understand the bigger picture of this conflict. You know, they closed off Artsakh. They closed, as I said, the Lachin Corridor, which has to be open according to the uh, declaration of November 9, 2020. And when international different countries and Armenia, they wanted to send humanitarian relief food to the starving Armenians of Artsakh. They did not allow to this, this humanitarian cargoes to enter Artsakh, the Aliyev regime. So can you realize, can you realize how, uh, you know, how can we have Armenian presence in so-called this territory under so-called Azeri rule 
uh, if they're even starving out the Armenians to now. And this is a way for Aliyev regime to basically, again, try to drive them away, ethnically cleanse Artsakh of Armenians. How do you expect Armenians to continue live, live under this brutal regime? And what is going on today in Sunik, in Artsakh, it's all also not only just local Armenian struggle against the Azeri invaders, Azeri attacks on Armenian Artsakh, on Armenian Sunik, but it's also part of this, you know, pan-Turkist uh, ideology, pan-Turkist plan of establishing Turan, which, as I said, Turkey is actually the main uh, power behind all of this.